Executing in the middle of a crisis, that may go down as your greatest moment as a leader. It will not go down as your greatest challenge as a leader. So what does it look like for a leader to drive change outside of crisis? Well, in a crisis, you have a burning platform, right? It's where the term burning platform comes from, which inevitably means we've got to move off of where we are. It's burning. It's on fire. We've got to go somewhere else. Well, outside the crisis, the platform's not on fire. At least there's no visible fire. With the pandemic, we're sort of out of the burning platform phase. Right? But there's still so many things that have changed and we've got to sell to those new people and we've got to sell in a different way. And that process has changed. But the sense of urgency, that immediacy isn't there. And John Cotter's first step right. in driving change was to create a sense of urgency. And for good reason. Urgency dominates. So we saw this pattern when we're introducing four disciplines to an organization. And maybe the CEO is doing a little bit of an introduction before I go up and introducing this idea and talking about how important execution is and how we need to improve and how we could do better. But then inevitably, we started seeing this over and over again. They would talk about how, but we're pretty good in a crisis. Sometimes even tell a couple of stories of how good they were in the crisis. So in last month's Chief Executive Magazine, you talked about pressurizing the system outside of the crisis. What did you mean by that? Well, I didn't mean to fabricate a crisis. <laughs> and that gets tried. It actually gets tried a lot. It also gets old really fast. Making sure that the strategic priority has as much inherent natural pressure associated with it as the day job does. The day job is pressurized already. If you don't match it, you lose to it. You might think, well, it's pretty easy to make sure that, you know, there's as much pressure and urgency around the priority as the day job. It's actually very difficult. Right. So you see the four disciplines of execution as a way to pressurize the system without fabricating a crisis. I like those words. A way to <laughs> pressurize the system without fabricating a crisis. That's, that's not a bad capture. So, Chris, are you seeing that pressurizing the system is still important for people who are highly performance oriented leaders. You wouldn't think so, but absolutely yes. Even if I'm a real bottom line, revenue, performance, production oriented leader, right? Over time, that becomes part of the day job and the strategic priority to improve. I can't get any more improvement <laughs> from that level of intensity. Strategic imperative is about doing something different. And they absolutely feel this. So, so yeah, it's not just about hitting the numbers anymore, but we really have got to be moving more of our sales to this new product or more of our sales to this new customer or we need to be selling in a different way. And that kind of strategic pivot is often extremely frustrating, sometimes more so for very bottom line oriented leaders. Yeah. Okay. Can you connect the dots on how you're using the four disciplines to pressurize the system? If you think about discipline one, and we talked a little bit about this last time, the question is, is there a clear delineation between the operational imperatives of the day-to-day -day whirlwind and that one breakthrough goal? That definition is the first step in terms of pressurizing it. And even in a crisis, that isn't always clear. So the first thing a leader has to say is, is everybody clear, first of all, right, on the day job? Like, everybody's good on that. And then, in addition to that, if we can get to one other specific result, we have a chance. Now, if it's day job plus two or three, we've just lost all the pressure. Yep. So can you provide the disciplines two, three, and four in the context of driving change? So discipline two, do I know the leading measures that we can directly act on to achieve the goal, right? Discipline two. Discipline three. Can I see how we're doing in real time, right? Is it game on? Because again, we're competing with the day job. And then discipline four, right? In addition to the 50 things I know I have to do in the day job, am I really clear on the two or three things that I committed to the team to do in order to ensure that the lead measures happen and we're able to play out our bet. And so if we do disciplines two, three, and four, and those really show up on a team level, 
right? If I do that, then what I've done is I've taken a, a goal that might have felt very ambiguous and almost out of reach. And I've now put it in a form where I can act on it. It's concrete and it's actionable, right? Instead of being overwhelmed by the goal and then retreating back to the day job. You know, Chris, that reminds me of the story you told about Jim Stewart. Would you mind sharing that with us? Yeah, so we lost Jim 15 years ago, two years before the first book was written, and he was the pioneer. He was the one that started it all off. He had a serious health issue, and they told him, you have to quit smoking. Jim smoked right up until the time that he died, and it wasn't because he didn't believe the doctors, and it wasn't because he didn't think that was important, and it wasn't because he didn't have a critical burning platform. He did but the urgency of the cigarette was immediate. The urgency of the addiction. See, quitting smoking was important, but I can do that tomorrow. This is a very real dynamic in human behavior. We may know something is incredibly important, but if we can't pressurize it in a way that is actionable on a day-to-day -day basis, inevitably urgency loses to importance. <laughs>